Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to welcome you to CLA's uh, the Environmental Law Section program on California legislation, how you convert ideas into, um, into legislation, environmental concepts into legislation. And I'm I have a couple. I'm sorry, I'm getting got to put the old phone on do not disturb. There we go. I have a, a couple of um, announcements to make prior to turning the floor over to Sabrina. First, I wanted to tell you that if you are, or uh, advise that if you're interested in being part of the California Legislate, California Environmental Law Section Legislation Subcommittee or committee, please email me after this program and I'd be happy to add you to our list. And at the end of the program, we'll talk a little bit more about what it means to be involved, but it's a great opportunity to get to know other um, environmental lawyers and to be involved with without being without committing a ton of hours. The for the legislation committee, we will be holding a ledge day, a legislation day next Friday, March 3rd in Sacramento, and I'll give you more information about that as we learn about it. If you're interested in being part of the committee and can attend next Friday, save the date. There's another opportunity to attend a ledge day. CLA has a legislative day, which is free to, to CLA members, and it's on March 19th. Right now, the keynote speaker is the T Attorney General Bonta. So that will be really exciting. Two more opportunities to get involved. If you're interested in being part of the executive committee for the environmental law section, applications are due March 1st. And then if you are in the Central Valley or are interested in traveling to Stockton on Friday, March 10th, or I think it's a Friday, March 10th, um, we're holding a Your Valley, Your Voice program. It's only $10. Uh, as uh, CLA noted, it includes lunch, and you couldn't even otherwise buy lunch for $10. But on top of that, it's great programming, and people have worked really hard. And it would be great, um, a nice way to, to meet people and learn about issues in the Central Valley. So without further ado, let me introduce um, Sabrina, who will be our speaker today. And Sabrina has a wealth of information about legislation. She is the person to go to if you want to know one, about legislation in California and two, the process. Sabrina is a clinical supervising attorney at UC Berkeley's Environmental Law Clinic and a lecturer who teaches environmental justice and legislative advocacy. She previously advanced animal welfare legislation as the California State Director of the Humane Society of the United States. She has 15 years of legal experience, including time as a public defender and consumer fraud and environmental protection prosecutor. Sabrina has been appointed by two governors to serve the state of California, first by Governor Brown to the Cannabis Control Appeals Panel, and most recently by Governor Newsom to the Los Angeles Regional Water Quality Control Board. She also sits on a number of nonprofit boards and is president of the Women's Political Caucus of California and vice chair of the ABA Environmental Justice Committee. In many of, the, uh, of these boards, she serves as legislation chair and advances policy issues for topics including women's rights and environmental protection. She received her bachelor's degree from George, from George Washington University. She holds a master from Southern California's Annenberg School of Journalism, University of Southern California's Annenberg School for Journalism and a JD MBA from Pepperdine University. Uh, she holds a certificate in sustainable capitalism and ESG from Berkeley School of Law and I'm, um, Proud to call her my colleague, and I'm excited to introduce her and turn over program to Sabrina. 
Thank you so much, Leah. It's so great to be here with you today and so great to be here with uh, everybody who's watching along. Uh, thank you for joining us and um, we look forward to this conversation. So I'm going to do some slides on the California legislative process and then I'm gonna um, reintroduce Leah to come back. Uh, she is the chair of the legislative committee for CLA um, for the environmental law section, have her join and we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, what the committee does, how to get involved if you're interested in that. And then we'll take questions. So go ahead and put them in the chat or in Q&A, and we are happy to get to those. So uh, I'm going to attempt to share my screen and hope that all goes well. All right, so everyone, please let me know if you can see that. Maybe Leah or Pam, let me know if you can see that. Looks perfect, Sabrina. All right, great. So again, uh, thank you so much for joining today. This is literally my favorite topic to talk about. So uh, happy to also talk with any of you after, uh, after this program, um, but excited that so many people are interested and uh, looking to find out more about the legislative process in California, which I find pretty fascinating. So here goes. All right, so just to give you a little bit of a background um, on legislative basics, so you might already know this, and um, you might remember this from your elementary school education, but um, this is just a little bit about what legislation is, what bills are, and uh, I just wanted to also share how many legislators we have in California. We have 40 state senators and 80 assembly members, and um, so each person has an assembly member representative, a state senator representative. Uh, assembly members get to introduce 50 bills per session and senators uh, get to introduce 40 bills per session. And when I talk about per session, I mean over the two year legislative session. So we are now in year one of a two year uh, cycle. So I wanted to paint a picture of California's legislative landscape just so that you get a sense of what we're looking at and the context involved. And then I'm going to go into a little bit about uh, how legislation, um, how the process itself works. So in 2022, a little more than 2000 bills were introduced. And uh, so this just shows how many issues are competing with one another, how many ideas, how many um, different um, advocacy groups are involved with you know, moving those issues forward. And uh, I think that it's important to kind of get a sense of how many bills are out there because a lot of times bills don't move forward, not because they're bad ideas or because they uh, people don't like them, legislators don't like them, but really just they don't rise to the top when there are so many issues that are competing with one another. So I think that that's important to pay attention to both in terms of if you are trying to advocate for or against a bill, and also that if a bill doesn't move forward in one year, that you could still try again in future years on that issue. Uh, so about half of those bills, 12, uh, about 1200 bills were sent to the governor. And uh, so that just shows you how many bills sort of actually make it to the finish line or the almost finish line. And then uh, with that, uh, 997 bills were signed by the governor and 169 bills were vetoed. The reason why those numbers are important is because different governors have had different takes on how much they will work throughout the process of this legislative session and be involved in how much they will veto or um, adopt at the end of a session. And so this gives you a sense that the governor really works um, throughout the session so that most of the bills do get, uh, do get implemented in California. Some governors have had more veto power or, or, or more, um, more of an inclination to veto more of the legislation that was being introduced by legislators. And so Governor Newsom is not one of those. Uh, so this bill is, I mean, this uh, slide is a little bit difficult to see no matter how I wrote this. So sorry for that, but I just wanted to show how many bills typically get introduced um, over the past decade. 
um, what you can see is that it's always around 2000. It has fluctuated, um, but I'm going to talk in a minute about the fact that uh, this year is the most bills that have ever been introduced. So uh, stay tuned for that in a minute. All right, so a look ahead at um, the, this session. So this session just got started and about a week ago, a week ago exactly, um, was the bill deadline. And so now we know exactly how many bills are gonna at least start out through the process. So there were 1,751 assembly bills that were introduced, 881 Senate bills. So that's a total of 2,632 which as I just mentioned from the previous slide is actually the most um, that have been introduced. Um, of those bills, and, and this is of, of um, important note, I think uh, 495 of those were spot bills and 551 of those were intent bills. So just to give you a sense of what that means, um, spot bills are not fully fleshed out language, but they are making non-substantive changes to an existing law or statute. Intent bills are where a legislator will say the legislature intends to do the following, and it can be something broad or narrow. But, but basically what this means is that there's about a thousand bills or almost half, about 40% of the bills, which we don't know exactly what they're trying to do yet. They're just sort of placeholders that are um, waiting to be fleshed out and, and, and discussed and, and um, a, a little bit further. And so this is important just in terms of like trying to get the process going for this year, uh, that um, this is a lot of bills that we, we don't actually know yet what, uh, what is gonna be introduced. So some of the big issues for this year, and I, I think I alluded to a little bit of it, but um, we have 40 new legislators in California right now because of uh, term limits that were implemented about a decade ago, and then a little bit having to do with the census redrawing. We have um, such a huge new class of legislators coming in. So this is really exciting because it is um, new individuals who are coming in with really innovative and creative ideas and who you know want to hit the ground running and get started. But it also means that we don't know necessarily how what these individuals are going to care about or what they're going to support or oppose. Uh, and we we think that this is why we're getting a, a pretty late start in terms of there being so many placeholder bills is because these legislators were just um, elected and starting to build up their offices and their staff and their uh, legislative directors and comms teams and everything. And so um, this session got a pretty late start in terms of bills actually starting to be developed in, in concept. Um, as I mentioned, the, this is the highest number of bills that have been introduced, so it's going to be a very active year. And um, there is a huge budget deficit, which is going to really affect both the budget process and then also just what gets uh, passed and uh, gets through the Appropriations Committee, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. But the budget deficit has been estimated at about $22.5 billion by Governor Newsom, but that doesn't take into account the fact that there's also going to be lower tax revenue this year. So uh, analysts are sort of estimating that at about $30 billion right now. And this is a huge contrast. If any of you were following this last year, we had a $100 billion surplus due to COVID relief efforts and a few other um, capital gains and other um, issues. And so this is a very stark contrast to the fact that so many things were being uh, adopted and passed and supported and implemented last year because of the fact that there were the funds to support those items. So that's going to play a big role. All right, so getting into what the actual legislative session, uh, this is the 2023 legislative timeline. Each year, the dates are a little bit different, but always around similar times. So the legislator, legislature reconvened on January 4th of this year. As I uh, just mentioned in a few minutes ago, last Friday was the deadline for all bills to be introduced. Uh, so now we know at least uh, the, larger picture of how many bills are, are going to start to move forward. We don't know the language of all of them yet, as I mentioned. Uh, and then bills go through what's called the House of Origin. So an assembly member 
introduces a bill into the assembly, a senator introduces a bill into the Senate, and that will move through that process for the next couple of months until June 2nd. Uh, and then at that point, if they do pass out of their house of origin, as we call it, they cross over into the other house. And then they move through the exact same type of process again for the next couple of months this year going until September 14th, but it always ranges in the uh, late August to late September range. And then the governor has one month to sign or veto those bills. So these dates are important to figure out uh, if you are advocating or supporting a bill or opposing a bill or want to make language changes to a bill, want to suggest language changes to an author. It's important to figure out what are those key dates that um, bills are going to have votes and move forward. All right, so this is a very confusing slide, but the reason I'm introducing this uh, slide to you is to show you that the legislative process looks very confusing, but when you break it down, it's actually quite simple, which is what I'm going to do for all of you right now. Uh, so basically how a bill becomes a law. Uh, it starts off as an idea, and those ideas come from anywhere. So the idea can come from the legislative legislator him or herself for some issue that they care about or have been following. It can come from constituents, so it can come from all of us. If there's an issue that we're seeing that we think uh, should require a legislative change, um, you know, any type of issue, it can be something environmental that we're seeing in our work uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. It can be something in our personal lives that we're seeing and just think should be changed in the state. We can go to our representatives and pitch those ideas. Uh, and see if they will consider um, introducing them. So the first is to get an author. So to get a legislator, um, either one of the senators or one of the assembly members to agree to um, you know, bring forward that issue. And uh, then the uh, bill can be written in a variety of ways. So the bill can be written by the legislative council in the state of California, the bill can be written by an advocacy or interest group. The bill can be written by the legislator's own office. So there's a variety of different ways that bills can actually get written. But uh, once they are written, they get introduced and have what's called a first reading. And then they are assigned to various committees. So there are various policy committees, which I'm going to talk about in a few minutes where uh, the bills will go to get fleshed out, have hearings, um, learn more about the, the issues, any sort of problems or red flags that are involved in those bills. And they go through this committee process for a couple of months. Uh, and then they have additional readings, uh, both amongst those committees and um, amongst the entire assembly and entire Senate. Uh, and then hopefully get a floor vote, which means that all of the assembly members vote and all of the senators vote, and then the process gets repeated in the other house. All right, so what are the policy committees that I was just referring to? So these are committees that have been set up with uh, different issue areas. For instance, uh, Bills can, if they're if they're dealing with higher education, they would go to the higher education committee. If they're dealing with the arts, there are various arts committees. If they're dealing with environmental issues, they could go to natural resources or to toxic substances. Uh, so there's a, a number of different types of policy committees and bills can go to multiple policy committees. So a lot of the bills we see will go to some of the environmental committees as well as sometimes the judiciary committee. And the legislators that sit on those policy committees deal just with a couple of different issues at a time. So uh, legislators are assigned to various committees and they really take a deep dive into those issues. On top of that, there's also staff that are the committee consultants. And that's all that they look at is the, that one specific area of the law. And the reason why that's really important is because they hold the greatest insight as to flaws or red flags that they see. What is the likely opposition? Are there issues with implementation and enforcement? Um, are there issues where this won't work because it 
it directly contradicts a previous law or something of that nature. And so they really have um, a, a ton of insight and would be very helpful to meet with, you know, if you are, are working on an issue that's going to one of the policy committees for a hearing. Um, there are various tools for tracking bills that go through the process, both in California as well as nationwide. Um, here are a couple of ways to track, which is LegInfo or LegiScan. There's also a number of paid software options. Um, and these are just ways to track if there are specific bills that you are interested in following. Uh, instead of having to go in all the time and figure out if they have been assigned to a policy committee or what their hearing dates are, gives you an alert so that you don't have to actively keep searching all the time to see what's happening on a given bill or issue. And paid software might be worth it if you're tracking, you know, a lot of bills, if you're just following maybe one or two bills, for instance, maybe for our legislative committee or something like that, then um, the, there are, are, you know, very easy free ways to, to follow those. So I have alluded to some of these, but um, there are so many hurdles that bills face throughout the process. You've, you've all probably heard of many of these uh, issues. Uh, the first is competition, just what I was referring to with the fact that more than 2,500 bills were introduced this year. So that is 2,500 different issues that are clamoring to get to the top of people's attention and uh, you know, inboxes and to get uh, the legislators to really pay attention to. And so this is why it's very important to involve advocacy organizations, um, or to really build up support, um, diverse coalitions of, of those who are supporting an issue so that um, it, it's, it's much easier to show legislators that a lot of people care about an issue. And if they can show that a lot of people care about an issue, uh, then, then the legislators will take notice because they are you know, working on behalf of the people of the state of California. And so they want to ensure that they are doing things that um, that matter to the to the public. Um, the a second hurdle that, that bills face is passing out of both houses. So it's easier for bills to pass out of their house of origin. And so you'll see a lot more bills that will pass in the first couple of months. The reason for this is just, I mean, it's a little bit common sense, but the collegial relationships that the senators have with one another and that the assembly members have with one another make the process a little bit easier when going through that first house as um, an assembly member is uh, discussing a bill with his or her colleagues and also a senator is discussing the bill with his or her colleagues than it is when it goes to the um, alternate house. Something that you will probably hear if you get involved with this process is uh, the dreaded issue of a bill becoming a two-year bill. Now, this is not always a kiss of death, but sometimes it, it is. Sometimes it's a sign that if a bill is being paused or being drawn out for a, a second year, that there are issues involved with that bill. Now, it might just be that... Um, Opposition is, you know, working, opposition and the bill author are, are working through some, some problems. It could be that there's just a lot of different implementation issues that are being discussed. It could be that um, there's a lot of details that just haven't been fleshed out about how something would really look and really be uh, enacted. But sometimes it means that the issue is, is complex or that there's a lot of opposition or that people aren't ready for an issue. And so it, it could be a bad sign, but not always. Uh, and then um, you will of, often also hear the term of appropriations committee or suspense file. These are different terms, but I'm lumping, lumping them together just for a general um, sense that if there's a fiscal impact to the state, um, then bills will go to the appropriations committee there are specifics with that of how much and, and everything like that, but I'm just being pretty general right now. And um, so those bills are kind of put on pause um, and then all heard at, at a later date through the Appropriations Committee and then potentially put on a, a suspense file, which uh, makes them not moving forward because of their fiscal impact. So it's very important um, as if you're designing a bill to 
to think about whether there's going to be a fiscal impact and as things go through the policy committees to try and really work on what that impact is going to be to the state, especially in a year like this, where there's such a deficit. So what happens if it makes it all the way through, it goes through the House of Origin, goes through the alternate house, what happens next? Uh, so it gets to the governor's desk. And uh, so the governor then has a month with which he or potentially in the future, she can sign or veto the bill. Uh, and if the if the governor signs the bill or if the governor does nothing, which doesn't really happen, um, the bill will be uh go into law and will be assigned a chapter number by the Secretary of State. Typically, those bills will go into effect the following January. There are, of course, exceptions to this. Sometimes industry works out uh, where they will ask for a couple of year implementation timeline so that they can maybe change processes or, or things of that nature. So there's a variety of reasons why bills could could go into effect at later dates. And then there are also a few um, exceptions where bills will get signed at some point throughout the year and go into effect immediately on urgent issues. So that also happens, but the majority go into effect the following January. And then I just wanted to include this to help people to find their representatives. I think that often people are hesitant to reach out to their representatives and um, they really do want to hear from the public about, you know, what we care about, what matters, uh, what issues we're seeing because they can't be seeing and hearing everything and they're not experts in every you know, different type of issue. So, you know, where we can bring some environmental expertise, for instance, you know, we can really highlight some of the problems or flaws in current laws or, you know, things that we think uh, could make things better for Californians. Um, so here are some uh, ways to, to find your representatives um, for us. Uh, and I can also share with you if you are, are interested in your local representatives or federal representatives, but for now I'm just focused on um, state. So all of your um, representatives, the assembly member and senator will have a Sacramento office that's located in the Capitol. Well, right now it's not because they're redoing it, but it's typically located in the Capitol. And they also have a district office or sometimes multiple district offices, depending on how large the geographic region is. So all assembly members and senators represent a, approximately the same number of people. But as you can imagine, in Los Angeles, a, a very dense area, um, they'll have a much more uh, a much smaller geographic region that they're covering versus uh, in the Central Valley or the Inland Empire, where the districts can span hundreds of miles. And so they, they will often have more than one district office. Um, ways to visit their website. Every uh, senator and assembly member has um, its SD and then their number, the number that they are, or A and then the number that, that they are. Uh, and then I always put this little plug in about following them on social media because it's a really great way of seeing what your representatives are doing, what they're working on, uh, what events they're going to in your district, what they care about, what they're following. Uh, and so it's just sort of a good way of getting a sense of who, who they are, what they care about, and how to engage with them. So now I'm going to talk about our uh, legislative committee, unless we have questions and I can do things out of order, but uh, I'm going to bring Leah back uh, and I wanted to talk about what the legislative committee does with um, CLA environmental law section. So I co-chaired the committee for a couple of years with Leah. This year I, I took a step back, but she is still going strong as the chair and has been for so many years. So she is truly the expert on the committee process and um, all of the good work that is being done um, with CLA ELS. So thank you, Leah, and I'm gonna bring you back on and I'll go through these slides, but please jump in uh, at any point because you know this very well. Uh, well, if so I could jump in right away oh, yeah. and just, I'd like to introduce our my co-chairs. I don't do oh, this alone. Sure. Um, I'm sad to see Sabrina cycle off, but thank you for your continued involvement. Um, but my co-chairs are Allison Smith with Stoll Reeves and Gary Lux with the Bay Law Group. And I, um, if you join this, the committee and attend Ledge Day, you'll get to meet both of them next Friday. 
Great, thank you. Yes, and if either of them are on, they're welcome to join. But I think that they were not able to come. But but I if you are, Allison is on, and okay. and when we're done going through this, we have some questions for you in in the questions and answers that that I'll lob to you in just a moment. Okay, um, sure. but uh, but let's talk a little bit about the our committee, and then we'll go back to asking questions about legislation. That sounds great. Uh, so. Uh, here's just a little bit of background about what the committee does. Uh, we review all environmental land use, energy, natural resources bills, and we provide nonpartisan feedback. So the reason why I'm highlighting that is because we are not advocating for or against specific issues. Um, within the environmental law section, we represent all different types of organizations, entities, personal feelings and beliefs about uh, you know, the environmental space. Uh, and so what we really strive to do is to use our expertise and our background and our knowledge to provide um, what we consider technical assistance and review to the legislators. So we can go through existing legislation, existing bills that have been introduced by legislators, and we can go through them and we can see if there are flaws, if there are problems. I will go into some, some of those flaws and problems uh, in a future slide. But that's the goal that we are doing with this committee. So it's not, we're not out there as an advocacy committee. We're out there really serving as a resource to the legislature. Uh, so we work with the legislative policy committee consultants that I just mentioned. We work with the legislators. We work with their staff team to um, flag if we see issues or to make suggestions of changes that could make a law, uh, a potential law stronger or, or better. Uh, and Leah, feel free to jump in with anything that I'm saying. Um, so the way that we do this is we um, split up all of the environmental bills uh, to be reviewed. Um, this is often a couple of hundred bills. Uh, usually at the beginning, there's probably around 600 or so environmental bills or bills that fall under the large uh, umbrella of environmental issues. But then when you read them, they don't all exactly have to do with some sort of environmental issue. Um, but we will break those bills up for uh, committee members, um, like many of you maybe, to uh, read and review those bills um, and to see if there are issues involved. We strive to uh, pair you with uh, areas that you are more of an expert in. So we have a form that we'll send to you that shares uh, some of the different um, types of environmental issues, and uh, if you can, you know, put on there if, if you want to just do anything, or if you have specific, you know, you want to do CEQA bills, or you want to do energy-related bills, or whatever the topic may be. Uh, and I sent out to, yeah. to existing members, I, or existing committee members, I sent out an interest form. If you haven't filled it out, please do email it back to me. I can resend it if anyone needs, but um, we really want you to be able to enjoy the process and review bills in the areas in which you have an interest, even if that area is not an area that you practice. In. Yes, thank you for sharing that. Uh, yes, you don't need like any sort of specific credential. It's just if you're passionate or interested in an issue, then you're going to be more engaged with what you're reading about. And some of them can be, you know, very dense and technical. Um, so it's better to have somebody that is interested in the topic. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, we interact with the legislative offices, which is always you know, very nice to be able to provide that feedback and, and support. Uh, and then we'll have various meetings where um, you all will report back to the committee at large about uh, how the process is going, uh, you know, if you found any issues with the bill, if you've been able to reach out to the legislator or the staff or the policy consultant, uh, and then later in the process, uh, you can share if the bill has uh, moved forward, and, uh, and then at the end, if it was signed by the governor, um, then we will ask for you to notify all of us about that. So what are the technical flaws that I've been referring to? So these are some of the various um, ways that we have seen in past 
bills uh, that there have been problems. Now, I'm not saying that all of the bills will have problems. A lot of times, um, by the time the bills get introduced, they have gone through where the legislative office has gone through it, the legislative council has looked through, you know, to kind of find and see if there are any flaws. And then sometimes they've even gone to policy committees um, by the time that we are, are seeing and reviewing them. So a lot of times potential uh, issues have already been flagged, but uh, there, are, there are definitely instances where we have seen these um, flaws come up just because it might be an area that is uh, a little bit convoluted. It might be an area that's newer. It might be an area where the um, member that's introducing it um, uh, is not familiar with the subject matter, but but you know cares about the issue, or um, you know got a specific bill language from an advocacy or an interest group, uh, and you know didn't follow up on on some of these items. So there could be undefined terms that need to be uh, included, um, so as to make sure that the law can be enforced properly. There could be ambiguity issues missing references, uh, internal inconsistencies that would um, make implementing it difficult, uh, duplicative terms we want to try to get rid of, and a conflict with other laws, which is especially where we come in to be helpful because we interact with a lot of these laws on a daily basis uh, in a way that sometimes the legislators don't. Um, some sort of inadequate response to a judicial decision or beyond the constitutional limits of what we can do in California. Um, and so there are always other issues that could also arise, you know, and so, uh, you know, please feel free to flag anything that you see with the bills that you're reviewing. Uh, Leah, I don't know if you want to share anything else on this slide or I'll move to the next one. No, I think you, I think you uh, got it and we'll we'll go over this again as to what you're what you're looking for and um, we really when you flag the items we we request that you work directly with the committee consultants or the author of the bill um, we don't want to be the cog Allison and Gary and I don't want to be the cog in the wheel to getting a bill corrected before as it's going through the the policy committees. Yes, thank you. Uh, and then this is sort of just a rough timeline, although uh, Leia, of course, you can jump in and say, you know, I think that you mentioned doing things a little bit differently this year. We used to uh, analyze the bills after they had already gone through the House of Origin. So we would start in the summer. Um, but So that's where this timeline came from. But I think that this year the committee is going to move things up, which is really exciting. Uh, I am a big fan of because uh, it means that all of uh, you will have much more of an ability to really influence change because uh, if you are able to review a bill in March or April and you see issues with that, or May, and you see issues with that bill, uh, you can really flag that and bring it to the committee consultants, the legislators, in a way that sometimes when you're looking at it uh, in July or August, um, those issues have already uh, been resolved. And so um, it this just adds to the ability for you to really do great work. Uh, and so I'm excited about that. So I think that will probably move up the timeline in terms of uh, when you're all meeting. We did. We're moving it to the House of Origin. And it has pros and cons to do it this way. Um, in the past, we've moved it to the second chamber when bills get into the second chamber because it reduces the number of bills that we look at and we might hit the spot bill language a little bit closer. Mm -hmm. So um, because we never know when that's going to pour right into the into the bill. But this year we're moving it into the house of origin because last year we missed some pretty significant bills that moved quicker than our timeline. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we, this is, uh, we're giving it a try and hopefully this, this will work. So late March, we anticipate uh, providing, uh, sending out the bills. And if any committee members would like to help with an assignment, uh, it would be a couple hours, probably the second or third week of March. Um, it's not a 10 hour assignment per person. We're, you know, many hands make light work. Then our first 
group call will be during the uh, committee process, during the policy committee process, April 14th, 10 a.m. Be looking and I'll send, we'll, uh, either Allison, Gary, or I will send out the um, information. We'll meet via Zoom. May 19th will be our second call. And August 11th is our third call with the idea that at that point we can catch any of the language that gets, you know, a gut and amend or a spot bill or something before while the bill is in the second second chamber. And then we normally have a call at the very end of the session where we talk about what's passed. Um, this year we did not. But what we're asking all committee members to do is draft for those bills that you've tracked from beginning to end that pass. Um, please draft a paragraph about that bill, and that way our website will be up to date with all of the legislation that passed. And by the beginning of November, you'll have an opportunity to look at what passed in the environmental air and energy area and advise your clients. It's a, it's a great resources for a, a great resource for us as environmental lawyers. Yeah, we'll definitely just flag that that it is such a good resource to be able to go and look at our site and you know a benefit that CLA provides uh, to be able to look and see sort of what is coming down the pipeline. So thank you for for raising that, Leah. I also just, as we were going through dates, uh, it reminded me, I think that you mentioned March 19th for the CLA Legislative Day, but it's April 19th. April um, 19th, yes, my right. mistake. No, and, and you may have said April, but I, I thought you said March. So just uh, just so that you all don't think that we're uh, pushing so many <laughs> things on you in March, because I know we've got the Your Valley, Your Voices, and our own Legislative Day. And so that one is uh, not until April. Uh, so I think that is it for me. So I'm going to um, stop sharing my presentation and uh, stop sharing my screen. And perhaps we can uh, land on questions. And and so the, the first question is one about your slide deck. Sabrina, are you willing to share it? And, and can uh, we email it out to our participants? Yeah, so I was not planning to, but I have no no problem doing so. So I'll reach out to Pam after, who's our uh, CLA liaison, uh, about doing that. Okay. The second question is one that uh, you know I, I know that you've looked at all the bills, but they just the final date was last Friday, so I'm not sure you're going to be able to answer this. Okay. It's, what's the proportion of Republican authored versus Democratic authored bill? that have become that have passed or become law over the past few years i was thinking it was this year but just okay. you know yeah so that's a great question just um because of the fact that i mean you're probably all aware of the fact that there is a super majority of uh democrats in california uh and so that might lead you to believe then that um, only Democratic bills are advancing, but I, I have not done all of the you know statistics on this and I would be happy to delve deeper into it for anybody that wants to chat after. But my take on things just as an anecdotal, um, you know, as I analyze all of these bills is that um, the bills uh, really do, the, the bills that the Republicans are introducing really do try to move forward because of the fact that they know that they have to gather support from their Democratic colleagues in order to move forward because of the fact that if it's just going to be Republicans voting on an issue, they would never have just the sheer numbers to get through the assembly floor or get through the Senate floor vote. So a lot of times their their issue, you know, the issues that the, that they are bringing forward will advance um, because of the fact that there is a lot of bipartisan collaboration so that they can get those issues advanced. Um, and so by the time they do reach the governor's desk, a lot of times those bills will also be entered, will be signed because of the fact that the governor um, really, uh, you know, is looking to implement what uh, the legislature has, has been trying to um, has been trying to work through and, and the governor's office really works throughout the year with legislators um, and with uh, with throughout the whole process. So 
um, you know, of course, there are a couple of fringe issues on, on either side that, you know, might not get gain the numbers and support an issue, but um, th there is actually more conflict I've seen between very progressive Democrats and moderate Democrats in terms of getting um, support and getting issues to move forward than I have seen with uh, Republican and Democrats. So that's sort of just some anecdotal takes, but um, don't feel like, you know, Republican author, Republican assembly members and senators have not been able to advance legislation, you know, on behalf of their constituents or on behalf of the state, they, they have been able to do that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The next question is, what does the first reading look like? What's the process? Yeah, so um, the process is, is really just like reading the bill into the record, um, you know, reading the uh, topic into the record. And so the reason for that is just to have a record of the bill uh, as it then gets assigned to different committee hearings. And then when we talk about like second and third readings, it's because of the fact that language has been amended in those policy committees. And so then when they go back to um, larger votes, um, they have to be read and, and voted on again because of the fact that the language has changed. And by reading, it's just introducing the topic, not reading all of the text. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, if, uh, could you explain the difference between spot bills and trailer bills? Sure, yeah, I, I mentioned a couple of, of different items. So, uh, and I may have lumped them together. So apologies if I did. So there is a whole, uh, group of bills that are placeholders in some way, meaning the actual bill text is not fully developed and crafted by the time of the deadline. Um, and so one of these is spot bills, which is just putting a, a spot in place for where you are going to introduce a bill. And these are for something where there is already um, an existing statute that um, relates to the issue. And this is making what's called a non-substantive change to that statute. So it's clarifying, it's updating, it's fixing that law in some way that doesn't just completely eviscerate it or completely develop something new. Um, and so those all fall under the spot bill category. Then there's also uh, intent bills and intent bills are where a legislator will say, something along the lines of like the intent of the legislature here is to do the following. Now that can be something very broad, like the intent is to revise Medicare, or it could be something very, uh, very narrowly focused, like, you know, the intent is to, is to, you know, update this area of CalFresh or something like that. So uh, it can range in terms of how, how broad or narrow that issue is. But it's just right now saying our intent is to do this, but we haven't fully developed or decided on the mechanism for doing so. Um, these differ from trailer bills, which are the implementing language of the budget bill, which is a whole other process. Um, but uh, uh, along while the legislative session is going on, there's also a budget process going on. So the governor introduces a budget in January. That um, budget is then revised in what's called the May revise. And then there is until June 15th to actually have the updated budget for that year. Uh, and so throughout that process of those few months, uh, assembly members and senators will work on issues that they um, want to advance in terms of for you know their direct constituents in their region or on behalf of the state of California on a variety of issues that are going to require funding, and they will put them into the, they will you know uh, attempt to have them be line items in the budget, and then there will be accompanying trailer bills that. Uh, you know, specify what that is, what that looks like, what that implementation would be. Um, so uh, it, that's not a spot bill or a spot issue, but it is sort of one of those other nebulous categories uh, that, um, you know, sort of arises throughout the process. Uh, and then 
one other item that um, I'll refer to is just there are also a couple of other types of like special committee bills or like special issues that will arise for you know the entire assembly or entire uh, Senate to look at. And then one other term that you might hear a lot is companion bills, where an identical bill is introduced in the Senate and in the assembly, and they'll often you know get merged in some way, but it's a, a way of having more support on an issue. So a quick follow up. On the spot bills or the intent bills, so uh, is how once a, a legislator introduces a bill, so we, you know, for our purposes, we might be looking at all the environmental bills. This is going to be an environmental bill. We assign it out for somebody to keep an eye on the, the language. Can it switch to another topic? Yes, and that can actually happen not even just with spot bills, but that can happen with all bills where um, a bill could be what's called gutted and amended into something totally different. So, uh, for instance, um, an author introduces a bill on uh, banning plastic straws. And so that, you know, looks like it's going to be an environmental bill. And so that's under your group of bills that you're reviewing. And then all of a sudden you start looking at it and it's talking about uh, what time nightclubs should stay open until. And you're thinking, how is this environmental? And it's, but if you look at it, it's a ton of red lines and cross outs. And you'll see that that bill has been what's called gutted and amended into something totally different. So um, there's also that which could come up and is always, um, confusing as you start to look at something and think this has nothing to do with what I am supposed to be reading or with what this title is. Uh, so that sometimes happens throughout the process. The reason why that happens is because legislators have, like I said, that deadline of, of introducing bills, but sometimes they'll start to flesh out a topic and realize, oh, this issue is not going to pass this year. There's a bunch of um, you know, there's a lot of opposition that I have to work with for the next couple of years on this issue, or uh, this is going to cost the state too much money and so it's not going to move forward, or I, I thought this was a really good issue, but, you know, the more I hear from constituents about the fact that um, there's all these flaws to, to what we were proposing, you know, we're going to, you know, scratch this concept or, or try and revise it for a future year. So sometimes that will happen. Can you share more about the suspense file process? About the you the suspense file process. Yeah. So um, so bills will um, a fiscal impact generally over one hundred and fifty thousand to the state, but uh, it, it differs in terms of with some various exceptions and things like that. Um, will go into uh, will go to be heard by the appropriations committee, and so that is you know another one of the committees that legislators sit on um, in the both the Senate and the Assembly, and they will review all of those bills. And the reason why they're reviewing all of those bills together, which you know you can probably imagine, but they don't want to um, pass out of their house a ton of bills that are all going to cost the state an exorbitant amount because they know that those won't all get um, you know signed and, and implemented into law and so they try to review um, you know what are what are those costs going to look like are they one-time costs are they um, ongoing costs are they enforcement costs are they new staff costs you know what does that look like um, and so those bills will um, all have uh, be heard, um, which does not necessarily mean it's a whole nother hearing. Sometimes when we say they're heard, um, they're just on the, you know, on the deck to be all voted on at the same time, um, but they might not get another hearing in front of that committee. And so that's why it's very important also, if you have a bill that is, you know, going to the Appropriations Committee to really, um, to really try and work through what those issues are in advance, because um, that is where a lot of bills go to die, um, because of the fact that uh, a, a lot of times, you know, they won't want to pursue bills that are going to cost the state, especially if they don't know if there's enough support for it or um, how that those costs are going to look or things like that. So, if you have um, 
a feeling that a bill that you care about is going to the appropriations committee, it's worth developing a strategy in advance of what you should do for that. Um, and then the suspense file means those bills have been sort of paused or, or suspended. Um, and oftentimes that means that they're not moving forward then for the year. So that's the code word for it's the code word for dead. Yeah. <laughs> So, so you know, there, there's all there's always like a couple of exceptions where you know it's not, but it pretty much means uh, it's not moving forward. Now, if it's in the first year of a session, it could move forward in the second year with the same bill number. If it's in the second year of a session, then that is just completely dead. And if you want to raise that same issue again, it has to be in a whole nother um, bill bill number that's introduced. Um, so that we have one last question here, and uh, is there an opportunity for law students to help CLA environmental law environmental section in the environmental environmental review pro bill review process? And the answer is absolutely yes. We would love yeah, to know. have you part of the committee, and uh, just know though that there's work during the summer as well. So if you're you know, if you're graduating and you're going to be studying for the bar, there might be an interruption for, uh, you know, for a meeting or two. But um, yes, we would love to have your participation. Yeah, I love to see students on here, and uh, I I think it's a it's a great way of getting familiar with the process with um, with CLA environmental law section. Uh, I think that. I, I would, you know, venture to say, I think for all of the committees that you're interested in participating in with, with CLA's environmental law section, with any of the event planning or, you know, anything that we have coming up, I think we would love to have student involvement and participation. So I know when I planned um, a DEI conference a couple of years ago, uh, we had a couple of students who were really integral to the process of planning that and getting the word out to their um, classmates about attending, um, you know, attending the conference and being able to participate for free. So, um, so, so please, if you are students on here, you know, reach out and, and interact with us. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about Ledge Day, which is coming up next for our Ledge Day, not the CLA Ledge Day, which is April 19th, um, and, and much, and a little bit more formal. Our Ledge Day is next Friday. It's only open to people who are on the, who volunteer for the ledge committee or, and executive committee members. And the, uh, I have to tell you because of the construction at the Capitol, normally we meet at the Capitol, but because of the construction this year, we are looking for an alternative location. Should have that by the end of the day, I should be able to send out more information with a full agenda early next week. Um, if you are inter if you are on this call and not on the executive committee or and ha not part of CLA Ledge Committee and would like to be, my email is Leah L E A H S as in Sam Goldberg at gmail.com. Happy to add you to the list, and uh, you will be asked to review four to six bills for sufficiency like uh, as Sabrina discussed and um, and and participate in the three phone calls that the dates that I gave you and I will of course send them back out. Um, ledge day is optional but the benefit is is that the committee consultants, the key environmental committees and key legislators staff, talked with us and we're usually a pretty small group less than 20 25 people about what their priorities are this year or what their chair's priorities are which bills they think which topics may go forward which bills are more likely to gain traction it's a it's an amazing um insight into what's going to happen during that legislative seat session and uh, I've always found it, you know, just fascinating. And this year, we, there are so many bills that it's nice to know, you know, where we should really be focusing. What are, 
what are the priorities? So again, Leah S S is in Sam Goldberg at gmail.com. I can uh, Pam might be able to send it out to the list of attendees when she sends out the PowerPoint and would love to have you join us. Um, so with that, our time is up and I want to thank Sabrina and Pam, of course, and uh, Allison and Gary for all their hard work. While they're not on screen, they do a lot of work. So I want to thank them and Sabrina and uh, um, thank you for participating. Yes, it was so great to be here with you all. Thank you so much. And please feel free to reach out. Take care. Have a wonderful weekend. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.